The southeastern United States was once a patchwork of forest and more open land such as oak savannas, pine savannas, barrens, and glades. The more open plant communities have become the forgotten grasslands of the south, and we now have less than 1% of them remaining. Most of what does remain are small, scattered remnants of these once thriving ecosystems. Shannon had the chance to discuss the importance of these prairie remnants with Kyle Leibarger of the Native Habitat Project on an episode of the Backyard Ecology podcast. Let's listen in to part of that discussion. You kind of touched on a very important point there because a lot of these small remnants that you're finding are along the roadsides or on private property. And you and I both know we now have less than 1% of our grasslands and prairies that used to be here. But it's easy. And I think most of us do this. We hear something is rare and we think, oh my gosh, it's got to be off in some very pristine remote location because it's rare. It can't be something I see every day. But in this case, it's not true. Oh no. A lot of times these remnants, these places are places that are, like you said, right along the roadside in somebody's yard, places that the people who are there see it every single day. They just don't realize what they're seeing because rare and normal and everything we see every day is normal to us. Rare and normal don't go together in our brains. But I mean, anybody could possibly have something like this right outside their door. Oh, oh yeah. And I have a really good example of that. There is a, uh, I'm, I'm, you're, you know, Dwayne Estes with Southeastern Grand Initiative. Mm -hmm. There is a really rare goldenrod called Porter's Goldenrod that he discovered a population of just across the line in Tennessee. And I think this is around 2000, 2005, 2008, somewhere in between there. But a uh, botanist from Canada was coming through Alabama and found a population of it in 2003 or 2004. And that was the first time that this plant, Porter's Goldenrod, had been found in 160 years. The guy who collected it in, oh gosh, I think it was, it was like 1860 or 1840. He collected it, took it to his herbarium. And then in like 1904, somebody was going through his collection and figured out that this was a new species of goldenrod. So they named it after this botanist. Well, that population, once Dwayne and uh, I think it's Dr. Simple from Canada found out what that plant was, they came back to Alabama and the population was gone and they had built a highway over it. So Dwayne had reached out to me. He said, I'm going to send you the location of where it was originally found and I want you to keep an eye out for it. Well, I pulled it up and it's not even a mile from my house. It was really ironic. And so I start looking around for it and I find another population of it. And so I rediscovered it in Alabama and it is in a residential neighborhood with really, you know, expensive homes. And there is one lot in between two houses that never had a house built on it. And, you know, it only gets mowed a couple times a year. And I found about 15 to 20 plants there that weren't getting mowed over. Uh, the rest of the population was getting mowed over. And uh, we kind of put a stop to that, uh, thankfully. And now there's several hundred individual plants there, but it's in a neighborhood. I mean, it's the last place you would think you'd find a rare species, but, you know, you said 1% of our grasslands are left. Well, here in Alabama, I think it's like 93% of our uh, land is privately owned. So a lot of these places, most of them are on private lands and people don't know if they don't know what they look like. They have no idea how to manage them. And that's something we can all help out with. That's something we can all educate people on. And so that's kind of why I like to speak up and stop and talk to landowners about it. Yes, exactly. And yeah, that is amazing. And you know your plants. Dwayne knows his plants. And to have it, like you said, right less than a mile from your house as being this plant that wasn't even yeah. known to exist anymore for two so many places, years. Two places in the world, it's it's S1 G1, which is the highest rarity ranking there is. So it's probably the rarest plant I'll ever find. And, and and hopefully we're hoping to find more populations of it, but it's super rare. Just, it's incredible. Just right outside your door and you never know. Yeah. And then this whole neighborhood has this 
place that they can go and see this anytime they want to. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. Yes. And that's one of the reasons why the more I get into doing habitat consulting and talking to private landowners and stuff about the plants and the animals that they have, I really have started to believe that if you're not in a place that has either been used as a crop field for a gazillion and a half years, so tilled and disked and planted and everything like that, or you're not in like a subdivision where it's been houses and you've got traditional yard forever, that if you're wanting to create these pollinator gardens and these natural habitats and prairies that a lot of people are wanting to do now, that you need to get somebody out there who knows their plants to actually look at what you've got before you start doing the kind of generic prescription that everybody gives of clear off the vegetation till it does get planted and seeds because you may have something already that's really amazing. And I've run into that a couple of times myself where being on somebody else's land, looking at, at it with them, they're asking me, okay, we want to take what's been a hay field and turn it into a prairie. When's the best time to kill off the vegetation, disc it, plant it, where's the best place to stick the seeds, all those things that you hear everybody recommend. And I take a look at the plants. And I go, no, don't do that. Please don't do that. We need to run a fire through here. We need a, you, you've got the plants already. Let's see what else comes back. Yeah, that's, that's the exact approach I'm taking on, on my own property. And, and, you know, granted, it'd be easier to start over from a blank slate and just plant some native seeds. But to me, what's exciting about it is being able to, you know, what I did was remove the fescue. Um, and so that's easy to treat because it's green when a lot of our natives are dormant. So you can treat it get rid of it, run fire through there, and watching that seed bank come back and seeing what shows up on your property, it's it's really fun. And and I keep a list in my phone of everything I see on my property. Every time I find a new native plant uh, that shows up, I, I, I put it on a list. And and there's probably 7,500 species on there now that have returned since I've gotten rid of my monoculture uh, fescue. But it's 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 harder, you know, because you gotta you gotta treat these individual invasives differently. You know, I've got Bahia grass and Bermuda in some spots, and and I'll just spot treat those. But you don't have to go through and broadcast the entire place and just you know start over from nothing because there's a lot of times there's something good in the seed bank that's already there. So you're taking a lot of the fun out of it if you do that and get to see what returns on its own. If you would like to learn more about the grassland ecosystems that were once common in the South. I encourage you to check out the book, Forgotten Grasslands of the South by Reed Noss. I will put a link to it in the description, along with a link to the entire podcast this clip was taken from. Kyle told the story of the rediscovery of a goldenrod that hadn't been seen in a very long time since its discovery. This isn't the only native plant that disappeared shortly after its discovery by science. And the story of the beautiful Franklin tree, which hasn't been seen in the wild for over 220 years, is one of the most fascinating tales about our native flora. And you can dive into it by watching this video and be sure to get out and enjoy nature in your backyard.